Welcome to the CWA Radio Network. You're listening to Amusing, hosted by me, Heather Randall. What if every thought is deeper than a daydream? What if it's a seedling from our Heavenly Father, our one true muse, pointing us to something we need to know? Let's embrace the freedom to wonder, take the invitation to explore, and learn everything he has to teach us in this amazing journey of life. Let's get this show started. Hello and happy Friday. You're listening to A Musing and I'm your host, Heather Randall. This is episode 62 and we are still on the topic of the screw tape letters written by C.S. Lewis. If you're unfamiliar with this book, it is the story of two demons, an uncle who is the mentor and a nephew who is the mentee who is a demon in training, who is commissioned with the task of coercing a human man to the dark side, to the enemy's camp, right? So, so far, we have learned that the strategy of these demons is to separate, number one, to separate humanity from the spiritual. And that's to break up the spiritual senses, to break down that spiritual revelation, that that realm of the spirit where God exists, right? To separate us from that and to get us to focus on the tangible, the present, the physical world around us. The second goal is to separate humanity from the divine nature of God through distraction and by minimizing God's power to make the ordinary things in life become extraordinary. The third thing is to treat the patient, that's what they call the human, the patient, with a dose of pride. We saw this last week. Just enough pride to divide that new believer from the body of Christ through a critical spirit. They also want to restrict any knowledge that he could gain by limiting opportunities for connection with other believers who could encourage him through the dry spells and disciple him in the faith. They also want to elevate the quest for emotional experiences rather than a true relationship with God. And they kind of want to like intensify the trials that come from being a follower of Christ. They want to amplify that so that he's discouraged and he quits and he gives up. What ends up happening is we have we have a an absence of that that spiritual sense, the revelation. We have a separation from um, we have no concentration for God's ways. We have no unity or discipleship, and this is a great position for them to have this new believer, right? Um, It cripples them. It cripples him right off the bat. So now all he has is the confession of faith. And faith without works is dead. You can find that in James 2, verse 26. So now the tempters are going to attack his earthly family. They've already attacked his divine family, his, his relationship with God. They've attached his, you know, spiritual family, his connection with the body of Christ and other believers, right? That unity within the body. And now they're going to attack his unity with his, his mother, his relationship with his mother. In this task, Screwtape suggests that Wormwood collaborate with another demon who is charged with the care of the patient's mom. So now we have three demons at work. We have the demon who is taking care of this, this mother. We have the demon who is trying to infect, um, this new believer with doubt and discouragement. And then we have screw tape. Who's trying to impart his wisdom as an aged demon. So their goals are number one, to get him to neglect natural duties in a quest for inner awareness and self-examination. They want him to start thinking of himself as holy, 
to, you know, he's a new believer. They want to just get him in a mindset of spirituality. So it's all that he thinks about, that he's always thinking um, and evaluating himself. Am I good enough? Am I worthy? Am I, you know, just that in, inward talk. So that he's constantly in his own mind, in his own head. And he starts to become distracted by all of these thoughts. And he stops doing his responsibilities in this house, in the house. Um, of course, this will result in annoyance with his mother because he's not doing, you know, the day-to-day -day practical things. He's just absorbed in his own thoughts. And, you know, of course that works because who likes to live with someone who's completely self-absorbed? I mean, that's not fun, right? The second way that they attack this relationship between the mother and the son is to attack the patient's prayer life. And they specifically want to attack the way that the son prays for his mother. Um, they want to get him to stop thinking of her as his mom who has a health need or who has this this need that should be covered in prayer. And, and they want him to stop praying for her like a son should pray for a mother in a compassionate way and to start praying for her in a judgmental way where he is thinking himself better than her, where he is not just praying for her physical needs, but focusing on what he perceives to be her spiritual needs or the ways that she is lacking in her spiritual development. And in doing this, he's judging her. So in his own prayers, he is falling into the enemy's traps and he's praying for her in, in a, almost a con condemning way. He's, um, and, and we do this, we, we think that we have a heart for, you know, the people that we're praying for when we see, oh, they need to be, we need to, you know, God to fix them in this way because they're not being reasonable or they're not doing the right thing or, you know, and we get focused on the, the sins of others when in our prayer lives we should be focusing on our own sins and confessing our own sins to God and leaving those those other needs to you know to God's care letting him be the one who um, convicts and not us so this becomes a major attack in which he is really becoming more prideful and much more um, judgmental of his mother. You know, this is this this is talking when we're focusing today on that um, parent-child relationship. But you also see this. You know, I've noticed this a lot in marriage as well. I've read in multiple marriage-related books. I mean, you can you can find this um, in um, praying for um, what is it? Um, the power of a praying wife, in which it, it it's going off this premise of you can't, you, you want to fix your husband, right? You want him to be what you want him to be, so you start praying for him to be what you want him to be, rather than who God wants him to be, and instead of praying for what, you know, God is showing you that he needs, you're praying your own selfish desires, and when we're praying selfishly, we're praying in a way that is focusing on somebody's faults, then we're not glorifying God and we're not leaving the space for God to bring healing in relationship, for God to um, bring that closeness and, and strengthen us, right? So in our prayer life, we really have to be focused on ourselves and our relationships with God and the needs of others and how we can support and, and bless people and not tear them down. So I want to, because this is such a major, major attack, I want to read a section of this. Um, so I'm going to start, okay, I'm, I'm on the second page of the third chapter, and um, kind of toward the bottom of this page. It says, um, since his ideas about her soul will be very crude and often erroneous, he will in some degree be praying for an imaginary person. And it will be your task to make that imaginary person daily less and less like the real mother, the sharp-tongued old lady at the breakfast table. 
in time you may get the cleavage so wide that no thought or feeling from his prayers for the imagined mother will ever flow over into his treatment of the real one. I have had patients of my own so well in hand that they could be turned at a moment's notice from impassioned prayer for a wife or a son's soul to beating or insulting the real wife or son without a qualm. This is so true. We can, we can um, disassociate in our prayer life the real person that, that needs our um, intercession from the person that we want them to be, our fantasy of who we think they could or should be, and then they become less and less. Because we build up what God is going to do. We have this imaginary idea of what God is going to do or what God is going to make that person become, you know, that's going to fit our mold and our agenda. And we, we detract from who they really are. We stop seeing them as individuals worthy of our respect and love in their current state. Because remember, God loved us while we were yet sinners. So if there is a fault, if there is a flaw, if there is something for him to fix... He loves them, so why shouldn't we, right? The third way that the demons are wanting to attack this relationship, this mother-son relationship, is to build personal frictions through traits, habits, tones. They want to build up oversensitivity, offense, those perceptions of, you know, well, I think they mean this, that innuendo, right? Um, they want to build resentment. They also want to stir up some guilt and jealousy. And I want to, um, I want to look at that too. That is in, um, uh, it says, um, Worm, Wormwood and, or Screwtape ends his letter to Wormwood saying, finally, tell me something about the old lady's religious position. Is she at all jealous of the new factor in her son's life? And we're, we're speaking about this relationship with Christ, right? Is she jealous of this? Um, at all piqued that he should have learned from others and so late what she considers she gave him such good opportunity of learning in childhood. So here's, a, here's that, that double whammy at the mom, right? That, that hit to the heart. Can we make her jealous that somebody else got her son um, saved? That, that somebody else was the tool that God used to bring about his salvation rather than her? I mean, what a petty, what a petty thing, right? But this happens. We want to be the one, you know, when you're interceding day after day for your loved one and some random stranger comes and leads him to Christ... Are you going to be grateful that they've come to the knowledge of Christ or are you going to be jealous that it wasn't you when you have sowed all these seeds and you've done all the work and all the time on your knees? Do you see how the enemy can work here? We have to be guarded here. There cannot be jealousy. A new believer has come to Christ. We should be celebrating. We should be joyous. But he wants to kind of put in that wedge there. Is she going to be jealous of that person? Um, is she going to think, hey, I... I I taught him first. Um, you know, is she going to be jealous that, you know, he learned from other people what she tried to teach him? It's kind of a silly way to relate this, but, you know, I'm a homeschool mom. I teach my kids everything they need to know. It, you know, all, her, all their subjects are being taught by me. And, you know, I'll put in, I'll, you know, read books with them, and I'm doing all this this work to create a well-rounded education for them. And if you ask them, you know, how they learned certain things, they're going to tell you that it was some PBS program. You know, they learned it from, you know, the Magic Schoolhouse or um, or Magic School Bus or whatever. It's it's going to be some program, Wildcat Kratz, or something that they saw on TV, right? I'm not going to get credit for this. And those things, to a mother, when you're sewing into your child constantly, they can, they can, 
be a little sting, you know, and we need to watch that. Our children are learning, right? So we can, we can nod to ourselves and understand this, right? The next thing it says is, um, does she feel he is making a great deal of fuss about it? So, um, does she wish that he was maybe less religious? Is she wanting, you know, him to be more chill about his faith? Maybe it's impacting her in another way. Maybe she's not a believer. Um, maybe her own faith is weak and she wishes he wasn't so extreme, right? He wasn't such a fanatic. Or that he's getting in on this faith thing, you know, on very easy terms. So is he getting, is he getting in to God's grace um, too easily? Is she jealous of his, um, his redemption? I mean, is she jealous of the fact that God has forgiven him maybe more than she thinks that he should or too easily? I mean, that, that's harsh, but I mean, that happens too. So let's go back to, okay, so they want to build up that resentment, the guilt, and the jealousy in that mother, right? They ultimately begin to believe the worst of each other. That's what ends up happening in a relationship that's under attack like this, right? We, we begin to believe the worst of each other because all of our little sensitivities are so heightened that somebody will say something and we perceive it as if that person intends to harm us or is being sarcastic or damaging in some way. And rather than believing the best of each other, we're believing that you know, we're believing the worst in each other. Um, Colossians 3.13 says, um, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Okay, so we're if we're in a position within our family, if it's a mother and son relationship, if it's a husband wife relationship, if it's a child to child, you know, that sibling rivalry um, relationship, whatever the division is in the home, we need to learn to bear with each other and forgive one another. Parents, we need to model this and we need to encourage this to our children. Forgive bear with one another's issues, right? Uh, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Romans 12 verse 9 says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. So there is no room for fault finding. There is no room for nitpicking. If our love is sincere, then we're going to hate the things that are evil and we're going to cling to what is good. How are we going to hate the evil? We're not going to hate the evil by bringing it up in our prayer life and smashing that, um, that person down. We are going to hate this, this sin. We're, we're attacking not the person because remember, um, it's not, we're not coming against the flesh and blood. We're coming up against spirits, the principalities of evil, right? So we're going to cling to what is good. What does that mean? We're going to whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things, you know, we're going to, we're going to focus on the things that are noble and worthy in a person. We're not going to, to dwell on the faults. We're going to amplify the positive. Um, let's keep reading that. It says, um, verse 10, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep up your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Now remember, they want to divide him, divide the mother and the, and the son, because the son is now having this great spiritual fervor and, and this inward dialogue going on with himself. It's saying here, never be lacking in that zeal, that excitement for your faith, right? Keep up your spiritual excitement, that fervor, that diligence, right? But serve the Lord. How are we serving the Lord? We're serving the Lord by actions. Sometimes those actions are, you know, worshiping the Lord by um, 
doing something in the body that's going to bring about blessing for others. Sometimes it's as simple as making your bed. Sometimes that is going to bring blessing in your home, which is going to bless the heart of God. It says, um, let's go on. Verse 12 says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Okay, let's, let's bite that up here, right? Joyful in hope. So when we are, you know, maybe somebody's not there yet. Maybe somebody is not what we hope will happen. You know, they're not, we, we believe more for them, right? So we're hoping for their growth. But we're going to be joyful and appreciative of who they are right now. We're going to be patient when they afflict us, right? So if, if they're... If they've got a sharp tongue, if their habits are offensive to us, if their tone is sharp, we are going to be patient. We're going to be faithful in prayer. And what does it mean to be faithful? You are remembering who that person is. You're loyal to the truth of who they are. You're not building this fantasy world of who you want this person to become. You are praying for the right now, the person before you. Verse 13, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Now, before you can be hospitable, you have to notice that there's a world around you. So you do have to get out of your mind at some point, out of that inward thinking and that over-spirituality, right? You've got to see the world around you and impact it. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scoot down to verse 18. A little bit, we're going to say, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So here we've got, in our story, we've got the situation of the mother and the son who are living together. And the, en- the enemy is doing everything in its power to sow division here. To, you know, sow that discord and to break apart the peace in the home. We are told, we are, we are instructed by God as far as we are able to do every bit of our part. We can't control the other person. The other, there are, in relationship, there's always, you know, multiple players. But as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You do your part to the fullest. Okay, I want to talk about moms before I close out today because, you know, this is a um, mother-son issue in, t- in this week's reading. Um, 72% of Christian teens, this is from Barna, they say they go to moms for opinions and questions of faith. 68% said that mom helped them through their last crisis. Mothers in this Barna research are reported by teens and young adults to be the leading household member who encourages church attendance and other things, sets an example, talks about God and forgiveness, and teaches about the Bible. The mother is a key voice in the spiritual development of her child. So what we're talking about from the perspective of Wormwood, who is trying to attack this son, we also need to consider, because I know that a large portion of my listeners are mothers, that there is a demon who is instructed to come after us as well, who is uh, tasked with the, the purpose of making us grow silent. Because when you have offenses build up, what do you do? You get quiet, you retreat, you throw your hands up in the air, you seclude yourself, right? You take on that victim mentality, you build walls that cripple your impact. We cannot cripple our impact on our children. It's vital. And the enemy wishes to do it. And we need to fight with all of our power against anything that the enemy wants in our homes. I see time and time again, and I've mentioned this before on the show, that the way that that the enemy 
uh, strikes my family. I think, I mean, I know the pattern within my home. And I don't know if it's a universal thing, but the way that, that the enemy seems to attack us here is that he'll so usually, it usually starts with a financial issue. He'll um, frustrate my husband with finances, which will make my husband more tense and, um, and edgy, which will, you know, cause, you know, issues within my husband and I's relationship and builds up that sensitivity there. It can also, um, then it'll be like family discord. And then the next thing, if, if that doesn't, you know, if we, if we have not passed the test of trusting God with our finances, if we have failed, you know, in guarding our marriage, then he goes after my children. And if my, if I, that usually, that usually clicks me in. When you go after my kids, I don't care who you are or what you are. If you are a tangible, living, breathing human being or if you are a demonic force, I will take you on if you come after my kids. That usually builds up all my faith, right? That like grows my faith in like vast amounts because nothing's going to come after my babies. That mom vibe is really, really strong with me. So that the enemy, if the enemy gets past that one, if he has been able to defeat me with my children, then I am losing ground. Then he'll come at me with health issues, my own health issues. And when I get to my health issues, my strength gets weak. And the enemy has come at me again and again in this way. Because all the other tests I can get through, but that is where I struggle. So if you, th I don't know if this is, you know, a pattern, but I'm saying it's strange to me that the thing that the, that the enemy in this book, and I, I want to go back and find that. Where is that? It says, um, in, in relation to the prayers, when he's praying for his mother, it says, uh, make sure that the, these prayers are always very spiritual, that he is always concerned with the state of her soul and never with her rheumatism. Never think about her health. This is what the enemy wants our children. <laughs> this is how our, the enemy in this story wants this son to think. Think about the spiritual of the mother, not the physical. And I'm telling you, in my life, that is where the enemy, well, that, that is where the enemy wins with me too often, is in, is in my health. So if my children, I'm just looking at this, you know, just talk, taking this personally here. If my children started praying for me, for my, you know, say my attitude or my, uh, my godliness, and they were, you know, in their prayer life, they were focusing on like some sin that they want resolved within me. Instead of praying for my migraines to stop, that is, that's a huge win for the enemy. Because my need, the way that the enemy is attacking me, the way my greatest need, my greatest source of struggle, and the enemy knows this, is health. When a mom is sick. Well, what does she do? She just kind of, she's stuck, right? We have a lot of responsibility on us. We have a lot of tasks that we have to accomplish. It's just going to funnel down into everything because there's defeat, right? You can't do your responsibilities. You can't function the way that a mom is expected to function. You can't do your wifely duties. You're, you are just less in every way. You are depleted. Your energy is depleted. You're drained. You have no, no resources to pull from. That's where the enemy wants us. Crippled, sick, handicapped, emotionally drained, defeated, and with children who are, instead of loving us and interceding for our health and our well-being, who are judging us and finding us lacking in our own, in our faith. That is a stab to the heart and that's exactly what the enemy wants us to feel. So children, if, if, you are, if you are a child, and I don't care if you're a mom and a child, if you have a parent, if you have a mother, you need to be interceding for her health. 
You need to be interceding for her as a human, as a human with faults, but you need to not be focusing on her faults, but on loving her, even at her weakest points. Pray for her with love. Look past those, those um, tones or those habits that seem offensive to you. See them for what they are, traps of the enemy. Walk past them. Detour around them. Choose love, even when it's the hardest. And if you're the moms, moms, you have a big job. You have a big job. You need to resist guilt. You need to resist the enemy's attacks on your relationship with your child. You have a vital role that you need to keep playing. Jealousy has no place in your relationships. Ignore your perceived ideas, what you think your child is thinking. You do not know their mind. Only God knows the heart. We think we know so much about our children because, I mean, they came out of us, right? We, we're raising them. We see all their quirks. All, we help them walk. We taught them how to eat. Their survival depended on us. And we think we understand them so well. But only God knows their hearts. Do not assume anything. Choose love. At the end of this chapter, as we live this out in our own lives, my prayer is that we are awake and that those those spiritual revelations, those senses that the enemy wishes to, you know, distract us from and, and um, turn off are ignited instead. That we are not distracted in our faith, but they, we are focused on God's ways. That we are loving each other in the body of Christ, that we are uniting with fellow believers, truly uniting with purpose. The purpose, you know what the purpose is? to bring God's kingdom here. To live out God's kingdom in our world. We, I pray, are guarding our relationships in light of what we've learned through this chapter. Guard your family. Join me next week as we continue. We'll be looking at the next letter. Actually, we're going to be looking at the next two letters. So um, join me next week with those two letters read. And that would be um, chapter 4 and chapter 5. I'll see you back here next Friday. You have a blessed weekend. Thanks for tuning in today. If you liked what you heard, please tell a friend. And please subscribe on iTunes. Also, look for me online at heatherrandall.com and connect with me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Till next time, I'm Heather Randall, and this is Amusing.